Uh, very dear students, this is Professor Dr. Jasmine. Uh, once again, we are on a video lecture. In order to understand the text better, in order to facilitate the students uh, that we are doing this right now, we are on The God of Small Things by Arun Dutch Roy. Uh, we have initially covered some of the chapters, and right now we are on the second chapter where we have certain things which are really important to be noticed and to be understood. One of these things is the uh, political aspect of the novel and that is why I'm going to lead you to that aspect of novel right now. Uh, you know we have read in uh, various places of the God of Small Things about the writer and about the characters like Sophie Moll's funeral and after that, we also came to know about the life of Hesta and Rahil. We also tried to discover something in the novel about Amu and then Belutha was also introduced. There was something about the introduction of the police, uh, that how does police come up and how does the police stations behave with the women. That was all talked about by us in the first chapter. And right now, therefore, the second chapter will be uh, under our consideration. In the second chapter, we have a number of important things. And uh, one of the important things in the second chapter of the God of Small Things is the political element. And my students will be having a fair idea that political element and uh, the other things which are related to the nation, country, and the post-colonial background, they also come up. This political element is not only concerned with the things which are or which have been happening around the people of that place, but also the influences of uh, the other powers, the other sources, that is also really very much important. So that is why I have chosen today this topic in chapter two uh, to trace how the political element is available um, in, in this uh, whole of the novel. Uh, let me say that uh, post-colonial literature, as this is going to be, is the literature where the political debate keeps on happening. The legitimacy of the rule of the foreign powers and then the legitimacy of uh, the struggle made by the local people in order to come out of that whole thing, that has been something uh, you know of importance in the debates and that debate continues to go on for a very long time as well. And so here also, like many other texts, we have the description of the political element. But Arun Dutti Roy's political element is discussed in a very different way. And not only she includes the influence of the white man's colonialism in the country called India, but also the influence of many other things as well. The reason being that she is writing post-colonial literature while living in a post-colonial state. English government has finished, English colonialism has finished from that country. The legacies though are existing, but then there are other influences as well about which Arun Dutti Rai would like to talk about. And that is why in chapter two, we have this scene, which I have written uh, with these words like uh, philosophical aspect or the political aspect of the novel. In this uh, starting of these uh, passages, if you just have a notice, you will be able to find that the word Marxist is written. Chuck was a self-proclaimed Marxist in the very beginning of the paragraph. This word goes to talk about that something other than the white colonialism was also present, existing side by side in the post-colonial state of India. For this purpose, uh, we should know that there have been two basic it's philosophies which have been working all over the world in order to form and provide format for the government. One was the capitalism, another was the Marxism. Marxism is also known with the name of communism and socialism also. Uh, so that is why wherever the oppression, as oppression is going to be one of the essential elements of the post-colonial situation, uh, that is why oppression is there and that oppression is, uh, is related with the capitalism as well, not only colonialism, but also with the capitalism. So in reverse to that philosophy of capitalism, Marxism was touted. And that Marxism, as uh, in roughly speaking common words, everybody of us will be thinking, 
that this is the kind of equal distribution of wealth and resources and that of duties and rights among the people. But capitalism uh, goes to other side, reversal of that. So right now, this is the theory which is working here in these pages that Marxism, Marxist people, or the socialist people, these have been brought in with the philosophy of Marxism in India as well, especially in the state of Kerala, where this whole novel is going on. For example, if we uh, read the text provided here, it says Choco was a self-proclaimed Marxist. He would call pretty women who worked in the factory to his room and on the pretext of lecturing them on labor rights and trade union law, flirt with them courageously. He could call them comrade and insisted that they call him comrade back, which made them giggle, much to their embarrassment and Vimachi's dismay, he forced them to sit at table with him and drink tea. Once he even took a group of them to attend table union classes that were held in LAP. They went by bus and returned by boat. They came back happy with uh, glass bangles and flowers in their hair. So the words in this paragraph, which are used as comrade and Marxist and equality and trade union, these go to indicate the philosophy of Marxism, which Chako, the son of Mamachi and Papaji, and Amu's brother would like to exercise in his factory. He was running his factory as a manager, but then he tried to propagate the ideology of Marxism by giving equal rights to the workers working there and by inviting them to the tea and by telling them what their rights are as workers or as the member of the trade union. That is all good, but then we find the description of the women only being called, not the men. Probably, positively speaking, one can say that women were the most deprived section of the society. They were doubly colonized people, and that is why perhaps the Marxist people wanted to work for the uplift of such group of the society. But then, on the other hand, the discrimination that is done on, in the name of capitalism was also being done in the name of Marxism, that only women were provided this kind of facility which Joko wanted to give no other facility, no other party like men or the boys were being provided like that. Possibly this is an intermixture of the post-colonial state as well as the entry and introduction of Marxism in the Indian state of Kerala and so many other parts of the world. And the writer has taken sides with that. The writer has also tried to interpret the whole situation, whatever it was. So the 1960s and 70s reverberate the introduction of Marxism everywhere. India being one of the satellites of Russia for a very long time, uh, though not now, but it had been so. And uh, therefore, the alignment of Indian people and Indian government have been towards the Russian people and so entry of Marxism as Russia was the upholder of Marxism for a very long time. And it has been headlong with the Western powers of capitalism for a very long time. So it's it's not unnatural. It's going to be a natural introduction that has crept into the text of this novel as well. So that should be read with the idea that the struggling forces are capitalism as well as Marxism under the umbrella of post-colonialism that has been going on. This is being described in this novel as well. Uh, for example, some of the other passages, if we read them, uh, like on page 32, the page is quite visible to you people. If you look at that, there are three words used here, in kalabs in Dabad. And then uh, in in uh, in Kerala language, it's uh, ekta, tuzi halai ekta zindabad, long live the revolution, the shouted workers of the world unite. So this is again the uh, ideology of Marxism being propagated. They protested, they brought out the processions, they... Uh, the people who are included by them and they would show as if there's a kind of revolution going on and that revolution was about the bringing in of Marxism. So Marxism was surviving there in the form of the people, the workers were being united, they were going on some type of processions as well and these people were formulating a significant majority as well. So that is why the name of K. N. M. Pillai and his son as the leaders on the part of Marxism that will also be there. But the strange and ironic thing is that although these people existed, although they had the power, they had the following, they had the people who could vote for them, but still it was not possible for them to change the lot of the people, the lot of Amu type women, the lot of Belutha type men, and the other people remained the same. But however, 
it was possible for them to make a very good statement. That is why Arundhati Roy has brought this type of thing into this novel as well. Like uh, if we come to this paragraph, uh, uh, we will be reading lots of things about the Marxist leaders, for example. And as one of this paragraph is here, where Chakko had been meeting the people of the party. And uh, so some of the names come forward and these names are particular names with reference to the Marxist presence in India, as this paragraph goes to suggest. For example, it says, uh, he was an undergraduate at Delhi University during the euphoria of 1957, when the communists won the state assembly elections and Nehru invited them to form a government. Chako's hero comrade EMS, Nembu Diripat, the flamboyant Brahman, high priest of Marxism in Kerala, became chief minister of the first democratically elected communist government in the world. Certainly the communists found themselves in the extraordinary, critics said, absurd position of having to govern the people and foment revolution simultaneously. Comrade EMS Nebudiri Pad uh, evolved his own theory about how he would do this. Chaco studied his treaties on the peaceful transition to communism with an adolescent obsessive diligence and an ardent fan's unquestioning approval. It set out in detail how comrade EMS, Nimur Dipat, government intended to enforce land reforms, neutralize the police, subvert the judiciary and restrain the hands of reactionary anti-people Congress government, the center. Unfortunately, before the year was out, the peaceful part of the peaceful transition came to an end. So this is the situation where one can very clearly imagine that though the following, the power, the votes, all these things were present and uh, Kerala state was also having the communist government with the permission of the Delhi government, but then very soon, corruption of the same system started to take place. And as a result, the Marxism, which could have relieved the people of uh, differences, it went under the heavy arm of transition and the theology propagated by its own leaders that could not definitely provide relief to the people, rather it became a tool in the hand of the people in order to uh, make their own fortunes or, or to make themselves uh, important in, in that regard, in that government. So as soon as it had started, it also finished up as well. So this is how the philosophies fail when the people are not sincere, when the people are not ready to accept the revolution, when, the, when everyone is not ready to accept that. So how come it is possible that one may expect from the public that they should become Marxist and they should believe in the theology and rather than uh, the leaders should also come with that. So in that condition, uh, it becomes difficult. Uh, my purpose is not here to trace out the reasons of the failure of communism in India. My purpose is just to highlight how political element has been discussed here. That political element which is supposedly there to provide relief to the common people and to bring the sources of the state towards the common people, they have also failed. So that is the lot of the people who are called small things here and who are waiting for justice. They are not provided with that. And that is why some God, some relief, some type of thing is required that should come and uplift these people as well. So ironically speaking, even that system, which was designed only to provide relief to the poor and the weak that has also failed in Indian state of Kerala. And similarly, if we proceed further, we may be finding some more details here. For example, this page, you can read some more things about this thing. Uh, well, in the uh, working condition of uh, the people who were very poor, they had taken arms in order to support the comrades or, or, or to form the labor union or to have some type of system. So that is why the writer has also tried to mention this thing. For example, if we look at the next page, which uh, which is which I will be just showing on that page, the paragraph that I shall be reading for you people will show some light on the fact that how the uh, presence of the people, the struggle of the people could not relieve them of the misery, whatever they had got. For example, just look at this passage, which is visible right now in the big large brackets, beginning with the word, the march. The march that, uh, that surged around the sky blue fly mouth on that sky blue December day was a part of that process. It had been organized by the Travancore Cochin Marxist Labor Union. Their comrades in the Trivini drum would march to the Secretariat and present the Charter of the People demands to comrade EMS himself, the orchestra petitioning its conductor. 
their demands were that ferry workers who were made to work in the fields for 11 and a half hour day from 7 in the morning to 6.30 in the evening be permitted to take an hour lunch break. The women's wages be increased from 1 rupee 25 pesa a day to 3 rupees and men's from 2 rupees 50 pesa to 4 rupee 50 pesa. They were also demanding that untouchables no longer be addressed by their caste names. They demanded not to be addressed as Atu Paryan or Khela Parawan or Putan uh, Playan, but just as Achu or Kilan or Putan. So well, uh, in this paragraph also, we have three to four demands of the people of Marxist theology that they wanted the, lib the people should be relieved, the petty workers should be relieved, the women workers should be relieved by increasing their wages and uh, the identities of the Parawan people or the untouchables should be counted as the human being, normal human being, rather than calling them special human being. But if you look at very keenly on the middle where the arrow is visible right now, the women's wages be increased from 1 to 25 pesa a day to 3 rupees and then the men's wages are 4 rupees 50 pesa a day. So this difference of wages proves to be the killer of uh, the very theology of Marxism. If Marxism says that all women and men are equal, all labor is equal, then why this difference of demand of money? So in that way, one can say that uh, the original and true philosophy of Marxism was not enacted, and as a result, Marxism couldn't yield that very fruit. However, the demands are for definitely for the, for the poor people, for the workers, and for the men and women, all the demands are being made. So in this way, some effort is of course being made by Marxism. So therefore, the writer is showing a type of tendency that if Marxism had been uh, implemented in true letter and spirit in India, possibly there would not have been need to write a book, God, The God of Small Things, because the small things would remain no more small things. They would become equal to the big thing, but rather there would be no difference between the small and the big, all would be equal. This equality level is just the dream of Marxism that has not been realized so far anywhere in the world. So that is why the need was there to highlight the situation and the condition of the people which may be called downtrodden people, which may be called small things, which may be called the people, bitwised people, or may be called the people who have no voices at all. So Roy is trying to give the voice to the people and is also jolting the powers of Marxism that their philosophy couldn't work even to bring the power to the poor people. So it means that, in fact, the capitalistic system, the cultural system, the traditional system is so strong that even the, the, the good philosophy of Marxism couldn't change the condition of the people. So this is what we can continue with that in order to understand what is all that is going on in the name of Marxism and the political element available here. On page 34, we will read more some of the details of Marxism which are not necessary to be discussed here. And on page 36, the things will be concluded by concluding all that. And the thing will be then related to someone who is low of caste and his story will begin. And that is why I shall be discussing the story of Valyutha, which is quite relevant to this Marxism in some next video lecture. So far, I have tried to conclude what is the political element discussed by the writer. How has the writer made a point that uh, even this system couldn't uh, give to the people such kind of facilities and the removal of their problems and bringing them to good identity? It couldn't do that. So in that way, uh, the Royce novel has the political aspect and element as well, and it has been talked in order to show the inefficiency and inability of the system to provide uh, good things to the small things as well. So that's it from me for this day. Hopefully, uh, we shall be meeting in some next lecture, and I hope so that every one of you has got some knowledge out of this. Every one of you has a little bit enjoyed this lecture, uh, though it was just a type of boring lecture, but still, it has given something to you, so do not fail to hit the subscribe button and to hit the like button so that the channel may be continuing to flourish and provide you people even more significant things for the next coming lectures. Thank you and bye-bye. See you in some next lecture.